All right, so worksheet seven. Uh, on the um, on your AP uh, the AP exam uh, that was uh, on that May that May date, uh, the two problems uh, that um, were used were the derivative graph and also Riemann sums. Um, doesn't guarantee those will be the topics that will be um, coming up on this uh, makeup test, but uh, at least um, we have some place to start with, um, kind of have an idea as to maybe what, uh, um, what the makeup test could possibly be. But, uh, you know, there's so many different versions of that first test, so I think I just clicked through a couple of them and there were some topics that were on one that were not on the other. So I think it's good if we just kind of have an overview of, of um, uh, the major topics and then uh, hopefully uh, that will be enough for you guys to review and uh, have that front loaded in, uh, in your head. All right, so number one here, it says uh, the graph of the continuous function with domain between negative eight and 12 consists of line segments and is shown in, in the figure. So we see that uh, these are all going to be nice um, geometric shapes that we can find on our own. These are our triangles, right? Function is defined by g of x equals def integral uh, from negative two to f of t. Uh, so whenever we see this notation, we know that uh, we're staring at the derivative graph, right? So this f is really at the g prime level. Okay, so that's what this notation is. It takes an integral for us to move from this f up to the same level as g. So that means f is sitting one degree below g, which means that f is really the g prime uh, graph. Okay, so we can make this conclusion here that g prime is really this f of x. So we're looking at this is our derivative graph that we're staring at for g for, for the g function. All right, part A, find the x coordinate of each critical point of g on the open interval from negative eight to 12. So we wanna find critical points of g, we know this is the derivative graph of g, and we can start labeling our, our information, right? All right, anything above is positive slope for the g function, anything below is negative slope for the g function, anything on the x-axis is where slope is zero. All right, so we can create our slope sign line. From negative eight to 12, critical points, wherever the x-intercepts are, three and five, three and six. Above the x-axis, so that's positive slope. Below the x-axis, negative slope. Above the x-axis, positive slope. So I guess we didn't really need to go through all this. This is really for part B, um, to be able to uh, identify these critical points as relative max, relative min. But we can say that the, the x coordinate of the, relative, of the critical points must be negative two, three, and six since our critical points, since those are our x-intercepts there. Uh, determine values where our graph has a relative minimum. So we look at the arrows, we look at the signs, we kind of visualize how the graph is moving. We know there's a relative max at negative two. It's gonna flatten out at negative three, but it's gonna continue decreasing. So neither a relative max nor relative min. It hits some sort of a relative min at six and then it rises. So we know there's relative min at x equals six.
questions so far? Okay, part C. Find g of negative five, find g prime of negative five, find g double prime of negative five. So we we have the uh, the definition for how we're going to arrive at any g of x value, right? We're just going to evaluate the area under the graph. For g prime, we know g prime is f of x, and so that mean, must mean that g double prime must be equal to f prime, right? We're just moving everything one derivative down. So one derivative down would mean that f is also going to go down from f to f prime. So we have everything in front of us. We have all the defined functions that we need to help us find g of negative 5, g prime of negative 5, and then g double prime of negative 5. Okay, so first up is g of negative 5. So we look at our definition. Our definition is the definite integral from negative 2 to negative 5 of f of t dt. Now we're looking at the graph, right? We're pulling information from the graph. There's no need for the problem to tell us what the areas are because we can find them ourselves. Now, if they, were, if they were curves like this, right, and the function wasn't given to us, then the problem will have to tell us, okay, this is an area of five, that's an area of two, that's an area of six, uh, but uh, they don't have to tell that to us if they're nice geometric shapes. So we're going to be accumulating area between negative 2 and negative 5. Now we notice there's something off about this as we are reading the graph, right? We would prefer to read the graph from left to right. So I'm going backwards, or right? I'm going from um, a larger x value to a smaller x value. So I would prefer that we're going to flip the bounds, okay? So we're going to flip the bounds so that we can... Don't, so we don't have to convert any signs in our head. So as we flip the bounds, we're going to pull a negative out. I'm going to make the lower bound be the smaller value. Okay, so now this is a more straightforward evaluation, right? We'll find whatever that region is. If it's above, we'll make it positive. If it's below, we'll make it negative. But then every, after everything is said and done, we're just going to go ahead and uh, change that sign. So from negative 2, sorry, negative 5 to negative 2. So it's going to be this little triangular area there. That's above the x-axis. So that's a triangle, 1 half base times height. So 1 half width of 3, height of 1, so 3 over 2. So we can make this a replacement, uh, replacing this uh, expression with three halves. But then there's a negative that's sitting out in front. So therefore, our value is negative three halves. All right, any questions here? Okay. Uh, let's look at g prime of negative 5. We've defined our g prime function as f of x. So we know g prime of negative 5 is just f of negative 5. And this is pretty easy because we are looking at the f graph. So we just have to pull the y value, right? f of negative 5. Okay. It's just going to be this y value there, right? 1. Finally, g double prime of negative 5. And we define that before as f prime of negative 5. So that's asking not for the area, not for the order pair, but for the slope, right? We want to find the slope of the f graph. And that's a negative slope. We just do rise over 1. We go down 1. We go over 3. So negative one-third, right? My slope is negative one-third. All right, no questions so far? Okay. 
All right, next page. So continuing with um, the derivative graph, um, it's just this is a little bit more extended. So I have uh, here d through h. All right, find all the values where our uh, graph of g is both decreasing and concave up. Now we have the slope information from the first, um, from part uh, A and B, right? So we have that information already. I'm just going to bring that, uh, rewrite that again. Okay, so positive slope, negative slope, negative slope, positive slope. So we know where the graph is increasing, decreasing, but it's also asking for concave up. Uh, that means we have to pull the information uh, from the derivative graph, first derivative graph about concavity. And to do that, uh, we look at the slope, right? The slope of the F or the slope of the derivative, first derivative graph gives us information about concavity. So negative slope, all this is is going to um, is going to be mashed up with concave down of the original graph. Any peaks and valleys are going to be a points of inflection. So if there's point of inflection, concave up. Point of inflection, concave down. Point of inflection, concave up. Point of inflection, concave down. So we know the critical points are all these peaks and valleys. So zero, three, five, and eight. So I'm going to going to line it up with my derivative um, graph here. So from negative eight to zero, um, it looks like, right, this, this is a point where uh, the graph kind of has a sharp turn, but it's still decreasing, right? So this is not a peak or a valley, so we're not gonna include that as a critical point. Uh, we're just gonna ignore that. So it's all, it's gonna be decreasing slope all the way until it actually hits a place of relative um, extrema there. So decreasing slope of the, of the first derivative graph is going to match up with concave down. From zero to three, rising slope, that's gonna match up with concave up. Decreasing slope, concave down. Increasing slope, concave up. And eight to 12, decreasing slope, concave down. So we wanna find out where the graph is both decreasing and concave up. So we wanna find, we wanna look for regions where we have down arrow and concave up. So I, I uh, labeled all the values so that I can easily match up my intervals here. So decreasing, that's gonna be this region, but decreasing concave up, that's gonna be in this region here, right? There's a shared um, characteristic that we are looking for there, decreasing in, sorry, concave up, concave up. My bad, that's, um, is that okay? So here, uh, sorry, con uh, decreasing and concave up. Okay, so decreasing and concave up. All right, decreasing concave down, decreasing and concave up. There's another interval there, right, between five and six. All right,
or if you want, you can say um, G double prime is positive. You can also say that as well. All right, good so far. And feel free to jump in at any time if you um, have any questions. All right, find the absolute max value. So absolute max, whenever you see those words there, we should be thinking extreme value theorem. So extreme value theorem means we need to test uh, the endpoints and we need to test uh, the relative max, relative min. So we don't have to test three because three is neither a relative max, relative min. Actually, if you see this, it says absolute max. So that, that uh, reduced the, reduces our uh, test points even more, only to test the endpoints and relative max. There's no need to test critical points that are neither relative max, relative min. And also there's no need to test relative min in this case, since we're only looking for absolute max. Okay, so we'll test x at negative eight, x at negative two, and x at 12. Now the way that we're going to test is we're going to be involving this um, definition here. So g of negative eight. We want to go from negative two to negative eight. We want to read the graph, but this is going backwards. So I'm going to flip the bounds, change the sign. So from negative eight to negative two, we're gonna look at our graph here from negative eight to negative two. So we're talking about this entire region here, one half base times height, six units across, up two units. So that's a region of six. So we carry the negative through All right, next up, g of negative two. The nice thing about g of negative two is that you see the bounds are the same. So anytime the bounds are the same, there's no area for us to find. That's just always gonna be zero. All right, there's one more point to test and that's at 12. From negative two to 12. The bounds are in order. We have smaller to larger, so we just have to total these regions here from negative two to two. It's below the x-axis, so I need to make that a negative. This is also below the x-axis here. And then finally, this region here, above the x-axis, another triangle. Six units across, four units up. So negative 15 halves, minus three, plus 12, we add all those together. And that's gonna get us negative 21 over two. I'm sorry, uh, G of 12, my bad. Fifteen over two.
not plus 12. So we have all of our candidates uh, in front of us. We want to look for the highest y value. The largest y value we see is 3 halves. So absolute max value OK, any questions here? OK, so for anybody joining us uh, late, uh, I'm just going over uh, worksheet seven. And that is found on my um, homepage uh, under uh, 9N. Okay. OK, questions so far? All right, this type of problem, uh, it showed up on the version that I looked at for your AP exam. So I wouldn't be surprised if this showed up again. But this is a problem that requires U substitution and uh, first theorem. So let's make sure that we are really comfortable with this because uh, I have a feeling that this is going to show up again. So um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I, I want you guys to be. Um, uh, to be able to get this without any issues. Okay, so it says evaluate the depth integral um, of x, f of x squared plus 3, x squared plus 3. This is a pretty messy um, evaluation. We can't work this out by hand, right? We can't do power rule because this is stuck inside. Uh, this is a function notation with the variable outside. So we really have to go through use substitution uh, to make it uh, more manageable for a rule that we can use. So if we know that we're going to be uh, um, applying u substitution, we're going to be looking for the u value. The u value is usually what's inside the set of parentheses. So these are the things I'm going to replace. I'm going to replace the x squared plus 3. I'm going to replace the dx. That way I get everything in terms of uh, u and du. And then we're hoping that this x will just um, reduce and cancel out as we, um, as we go through our uh, u substitution. Right. du dx cross multiply we solve for dx okay. we're ready to start making our substitutions this gets replaced with u the ds gets replaced with du over 2x We see that the x's cancel out nicely. There is a leftover 2 that we don't want to lose track of. So if I push this 2 out in front, notice that's in the denominator. So I don't want to put, make that a 2, right? I want to make that a 1 half. Okay, uh, we are looking at the F graph, right? This is one of those problems where we're not gonna find the antiderivative uh, in terms of using first theorem because this is the F graph, right? This is the F graph that we're seeing in front of us. So really we're just, we can go directly into finding the area under the, under the, gir under the curve. Uh, but the issue right now is we wanna know where the bounds are. Right? The bounds are not going to be 0 and 3 because if we stick 0 and 3 here, 
then there's a mismatch, right? This is in terms of X, but right now we're in terms of U. So let's go and convert our balance, right? We want everything in terms of U, that way we're gonna treat this like our F of U function, and then we can um, evaluate the area. But right now we're hung up on not knowing where the bounds are. So we have to go through our conversion. The way we convert is um, we go through this um, definition here, right? We stick zero in for X, we find a new uh, lower bound. We stick the three in for X and we find a new upper bound. Okay, so we're gonna convert bounds here. So there's my initial uh, lower bound. I'm gonna push it through this x squared plus three here. Okay, so there's my new lower bound, which is three. I'll do the same thing for my upper bound. All right, so now we have a much um, easier time making the ap appropriate adjustments, getting everything in terms of U. So now we can simply just find the area of the F graph between three and 12. So we just care about what's between three and 12. So just this region here, negative three plus 12. Okay. We don't wanna lose the one half that uh, is uh, that leftover coefficient that's gonna attach itself until the very end of the problem. So we get negative three plus 12, which is nine, nine over two, which is 4.5. You can leave it at nine over two or 4.5. I do wanna show you another variation of this, uh, but that's gonna come later on. So sometimes we're gonna go through first theorem and actually get this to be uh, another function, but because we're already looking at the F graph, we have everything in front of us. We just have to, just have to clean up that bound so that uh, we're able to, to read our bounds uh, properly. Okay, uh, part H. H of X is defined as the square root of F of X. We're gonna find H prime of 10. So to find H prime of 10, we first have to find H prime of X. To find H prime of X, we have to recognize this is a function within a function. There's a chain rule that's gonna happen here. Before we get to chain rule, let me uh, get that right side to be to be more visually helpful. So now we can see more clearly where the outside and inside function is, right? Outside is the bracket to the one half. We'll do power rule there. And then f of x is just the function we can find the derivative of that separately. Okay, so we'll start off with outside functions derivative. And when we take the outside function, we leave the inside alone. And then we multiply by the inside functions derivative. So F becomes F prime. So there's our full derivative outside derivative times inside derivative. We can clean this up first if you like, or you can do it later.
Okay, it's up to you. But either way, now we're ready to insert that X. So f of 10, we just go to our graph, find that y value. f of 10 is just going to be 2, right? That's just a y value of 2. So we're going to replace this f of 10 with 2. And then f prime of 10 is asking for, what is the slope of the f graph at 10? And the slope of the f graph there that is part of us, uh, this line here, and this line has a consistent slope all the way through, down one over one, right? That's a slope of negative one. So we can replace f prime of 10 with negative one. Okay, any questions there? Okay, so that's number one off of uh, the review sheet. No questions there. Okay, here's the uh, number two. We have a table of values. Approximate eight, uh, well, let me read this problem here. Uh, Saturday before Mother's Day, drugstore has a large selection of greeting cards. Between zero and 10, the number of cards left on the shelf at time t equals hours is changing at a rate of m prime. So m prime is telling us how fast uh, cards are leaving the shelf. So negative 15 cards per hour uh, is flying off the shelf. And then negative 10, negative 12, negative 14, negative uh, 12. Function m is twice differentiable. So we know that the m graph is a smooth curve. m of 7 is 44. So this tells us that at, um, uh, uh, at the seventh hour, um, there's 44 cards left on the shelf. Okay. So approximate m double prime of six. So we're asking for the slope of the m prime graph, right? Um, but it says approximate because we don't know exactly the slope at six, but we have five and seven. So we're just gonna pick the closest order pairs um, to six. Okay, using correct units, interpret the meaning of m double prime of six. So m double prime is the rate at which, or it's the rate of change of the rate of cards left on the shelf, right? It's, this is already a rate, so this is gonna be a rate on top of a rate. So we can say that so the rate of cards leaving the shelf is increasing or approximately increasing 
notice that we have a, a, a rate um, uh, description on top of another rate, right? So card per hour per hour, so card per hour squared. Right, part C, write the equation of the line tangent at t equals seven. So if I wanna find tangent uh, line, I need to find order pair, I need to find slope. So the order pair, there's our order pair, right? M of seven equals 44. So I can think of this as my T1 and this is my M1. Instead of, X, instead of X1 and Y1, I can call this T1 and M1. Uh, I also need to find the slope. The slope M prime of seven is negative 12 because we can pull that from our table. So I have enough to write my equation, right? This is my tangent line equation in point slope form. But I'm just going to um, convert this to be in terms of uh, m and t here. So n minus m1 is equal to all right, just to get it into variables that we're working with instead of x and y, it's m and t or t and m, t being the independent variable, m being the dependent variable. Okay, so I'll replace these three portions there. Solve for M, or I can think of this solving for Y, right? I'm just using a different set of variables here. So that's the first part. I have my equation written, but now I'm gonna use this to approximate m of nine. So all that's saying is I'm just gonna take that nine and I'm just gonna put it into this t value there. All right, I'm just gonna find m of nine using this equation. So that becomes two, two times um, negative 12 is negative 22. I'm sorry, negative 24 uh, plus 44 is equal to 20. So that means approximately at the ninth hour in, there's going to be 20 cards left um, on the shelf. All right, no questions so far. All right, part D, uh, is there a time between zero and seven such that M double prime is equal to zero? Now, this is not the M double prime graph, so we're trying to see, can we guarantee a slope of zero, okay? Now, if it's asking, is M prime of C is equal to zero? Let me just um, adjust this question here. Can we guarantee that M prime of C is equal to zero? Now, if it's asking for M prime of C, then you're looking for order pairs, right? Can we guarantee that M prime is gonna be equal to zero? We can't, right? Because there's a negative 15, it goes all the way down to negative 10, but it, sorry, it goes all the way up to negative 10, but it's never, maybe it goes to zero, but we can't confirm based off of this, right? And this would be, if it's asking for M prime of C, and they give you M prime, this would be a IVT problem, right? But here you have M prime, but it's asking for the slope. So if I'm trying to guarantee slope, then that's more of a NVT rolls problem. Now the distinction is MVT is guaranteeing a slope that could be three or five or eight or negative six, but this specific zero is of, uh, under this rolls category. So if I wanna guarantee a slope of zero, 
I need my M prime endpoints to be the same. All right, so we look at our M prime and can we, do we find any M primes that are the same value, All right? Obviously not at the endpoints, but do we see any other uh, M primes that are the same and we do between four and seven, right? So between four and seven, imagine that these are ordered pairs. You have four and seven, okay? They're both sitting on negative 12. So, If you have two order pairs that are the same y value, then that means between there must be a slope zero, right? There must be a slope zero because the graph has to eventually come back up or go up and come back down uh, in order to, to reach that point again. So this is a Rolle's theorem and we know Rolle's theorem will pass because we can comfortably, comfortably guarantee that the graph is going to go down and come back up again. It may not be at five, but between four and seven, it has to um, slope back up again. Okay. So we're gonna apply Rolle's theorem and we have our conditions here, right? Rolle's theorem uh, requires that M prime is continuous. M prime is differentiable. And those are all true because we have that statement there. So no sharp turns, no uh, sudden holes in the graph or vertical asymptotes. And then we need the endpoints to be the same. So in this case, the endpoints that we're gonna use are uh, four and seven. So by Rolle's theorem, there must be a C value, right? There must be a C value where M prime is equal to zero. Or M double prime. since m prime of seven is equal to m prime of four. Okay, any questions there? Okay, uh, whenever you see a kind of a limit problem and it looks like it's fairly complicated, Chances are this is going to be a L'Hopital's. Um, so if you so if you suspect a L'Hopital's problem, go through these steps. Okay, so you're going to test the limit for the top and bottom separately. Okay. So I'm going to plug seven in for all the. Uh, whoops, this should be a T here. Uh, for all the t's in my numerator expression. So that's m of seven minus seven squared plus five. m of seven, we have that order pair there. So that's 44. So 44 minus 49 plus five, that's zero. Okay. So we're suspecting this could fall under L'Hopital's rule and the top condition matches. So now I'm going to separately um, to the limit of the denominator. And just like what we suspected, we get zero over zero. I'm not gonna write zero over zero though. I'm just going to write by L'Hopital's. And I'm going to go ahead and just find the derivative of my numerator and denominator expression. So 
So I'm um, going to jump directly into the derivative. M becomes M prime. T squared becomes minus 2T. 5 goes to 0. 14 goes to 0. And negative 2T becomes negative 2. We have our reduced expression. Now we're going to plug um, 7 in for all the Ts. M prime of seven, that means, let's see, M prime of seven, we have that, right? M prime of seven is just negative 12. So that's negative 26 over negative two. And that gives us positive 13. All right, questions there? All right, so this is where Riemann sums is going to come in. Um, use right Riemann sum with four subintervals to indicate or to estimate the depth integral of m prime from zero to seven. So I'm going to use all the intervals that I see in front of me and su um, subtract my t values to get my width: one minus zero, four minus one. 5 minus 4, 7 minus 5. And then I'm going to pick um, the height on the right endpoint of each subinterval. Squiggly line to indicate that it's an approximation with times height. With times height. And we go down the line. Use our calculator. Okay, any questions there? All right, uh, part G. This is similar to what we did before. Um, there's the use substitution, but after use substitution, it's going to feel a little bit different. And I want to go through this. I feel like this is maybe more of what um, has occurred on uh, previous examples, uh, previous practice, as well as on this previous AP exam. So let's go through that. We know that we don't have a, we don't have a nice clean rule for this expression, but if I can get these to be replaced, then I have a, a cleaner rule for me to apply. So there's my use substitution portion. Okay, my derivative. DT cross multiply. And I'll start making my substitutions. m double prime of u, dt gets replaced with du over negative 3. Pull the negative 3 out, careful, it's in the denominator, so when it comes out, we also want to make sure that it stays in the denominator. Okay, m double prime, now if you look, we have nothing that deals with m double prime. So we don't have, a, we don't have a, a, a table of values to use. We don't have a graph. We don't have a function. So we really need to convert this m double prime into another function. And this is where first theorem comes in, right? First theorem tells us that if I take the depth integral of, let's say, f double prime, it's going to turn itself into f prime, right? I'm going to make it convert into a different form so that I have something that's available for me to use. Because right now, I just don't have any m double prime for me to, uh, to apply. So we'll, we'll uh, uh, take care of the uh, antiderivative and convert this to be a different function. So m double prime is going to convert itself into m prime. Right, We're moving 
the second derivative up to the first derivative level. Okay, so we've converted, we've applied our calculus, we've, we've applied our antiderivative. Uh, but now I want to figure out a way to work in the bounds, right? So in this case, I feel like it's easier if I just get this in terms of my original variable, and that way I can use my original bounds. So I'm gonna just, I already have my antiderivative, so I'm going to put my original variable back. And then I'm gonna evaluate the bounds. And we're capable of doing this because we have m prime, and we're hoping that after we plug the one and zero in, uh, we're gonna have some values that will match and we can use. Oops, I left something off here. This negative one third needs to stay with my answer here. I'll plug the one in. So conveniently, we do have values that we can use m prime of four is negative 12. And then m prime of seven is also negative 12. Okay, any questions there? Okay, for H, uh, it says let H of T be M of T times P of T, where P can be modeled by the graph, find H prime of seven. Now, if I wanna find H prime, notice that this is, um, organized in a multiplication problem. So I have to go through product rule here, right? So there's my f prime g plus f g prime. Replace every t with seven. Now m prime and m, we can safely use the table that we've um, been finding. Well, and, the, and this given to us, right? M of seven is 44, and prime of seven is negative 12. Now the question is, how do we involve the P and P prime? Well, they give us something that we can use because it says P is defined by this graph. So if I wanna find P of seven, I just go to my, my graph here. So P of seven, I can find that here. All right, so P of seven, it's just gonna be five, right? That's just an order pair. So I'll replace that with five. And then P prime of seven, that's basically asking for the slope of this line, right? So the slope 
is up one over two, right? So my slope is one half. So I have negative 60 plus 22. Any questions there? Uh, looking at um, one of the versions on the AP exam, I found a slope field. I didn't want to show that exact problem since I, uh, I think College Board still doesn't want um, teachers and, and students to be sharing those um, secure copies. But what I did was I just created my own example, and I'll go through that example with you. And it's on, uh, if you want to pull up a copy of that to, uh, to look at, um, it's, it's on that same section where you pulled six and seven, and I just put a slow field example. Um, okay, so this is what the similar problem that I saw on um let me let me see if i can get this a little bit easier for you guys to see okay so here's the problem uh, the problem that was similar to um, uh, the exam. It says, uh, and this, I don't think this showed up on every version, but um, I saw a slope field, so I figured, well, might as well get more comfortable with it or review it. It says, describe how you know that this slope field is not the equation for 3 over y squared, right? How can you tell by looking at this that this can't be the 3 over y squared? And the question was, um, you know, list out the properties that you know is conflicting with between this slow field and this differential equation. And uh, one thing that I notice is, well, if this is giving me information about my slope, then any variable in the denominator will give me information where the slope uh, is undefined, right? So whenever uh, y is zero in this case, I should be getting a zero undefined. So that's one thing that I notice, right? So if y is zero, I should be getting dy dx equals three over zero. And you know three over zero is undefined, right? So that means when y equals zero, that means that's this entire x-axis. But we see that's not the case, right? We see that all these have slow fields defined, so that's conflicting with what we know must be a property and we don't see it on this graph. All right, so that's one. Another one that I see is, I see all these empty places, right? All these empty places um, when x is zero. So this is showing me that when x is zero, my slope is undefined. But we know that zero is not gonna have any impact, right? When x is zero, it has no dependence. It's just depending completely on the y value. So I shouldn't be getting all these undefined places. Now, if it was three over x squared, then that makes more sense, right? But we see that this differential equation um, is not going to have any restrictions for x equals zero. So, you know, we, these should all be filled in, right? Let's say I, I pick an order pair of zero, five, right? If I pick an order pair of zero, five, there's no x value. I'll, I'll get three over five squared, three over 25. That's a small positive fractional value, but it's still a number. So that number should be represented somehow uh, uh, through that 
uh, well, sorry, over here through that order pair. And then finally, one more thing that I notice is if my differential equation is based purely on my y value, that means for any specific y value, I should be getting the same number every time, right? So when y is equal to 5, it could be 0, 5, negative 1, 5, 3, 5, 4, 5. All these values here, I'm going to highlight those. All this is where y is, maybe it's different x value, but this difference equation doesn't care about the x value, right? All these y values should all be the same slope, right? Because that's a y value of 5. That points a y value of 5. The x value is different, but the x value has no impact on this value. So you see all these are different slopes, but I should be getting the same, uh, same slopes everywhere. Uh, but I, that's not the case that we see here, right? We see a slope close to zero, we see a positive slope, um, and we see slope undefined, and that's not consistent with what we see there. So what should happen is 3 over y squared should really look like this. Now, on the AP exam, you're never going to be asked to create any slope fields. You're just, the most that they'll ask you to do is identify um, you know, properties that is consistent or not consistent and be able to show the grader that you understand um, how to read a slope field, right? Just like what we expected, we expected everything across the horizontal line to must have the same slope. It should look like this, right? When y is zero, I should be getting undefined slope. I shouldn't see any uh, segments here. And then these should not be, um, should, shouldn't be blank, right? All these uh, x equals zero has no bearing. I should be uh, getting the same slopes all the way across. So just wanted to kind of review a little bit with uh, reading a slope field. So yeah, that's basically what I wanted to go through with you. Um, I'm not gonna go over uh, worksheet six unless you have specific problems that you want me to do uh, for six because I feel like this goes through the same thing and I don't want to hold you longer than um, uh, especially if it's if it's a very you know very similar uh, process um, I will uh, actually let me do let, let me do one thing though because on uh, I think on this uh, first uh, this AP exam that most students took it didn't have a differential equation. I'm not saying it's going to show up, but I figured, well, it's possible that they may have a different variation of the exam where they may not go over, you know, the exact same thing, right? Because if it did, maybe that could be considered uh, more advantageous for students who've taken it the second time if, if, um, if they can review through all the items from the first exam. So this is one standout that I did not see on the AP exam. So um, I figured, why don't I just go through this just to kind of review. Okay. So this is off of worksheet six, and this is part I. I'll work through it from scratch. So worksheet six. And find a particular solution. So I'm going to start off by cross multiplying, separating the variables. But really, the only thing that I need to move is this dx, right? Move the dx over to the right side and, uh, and then move the 10 minus y over. I'll, I'll do the dx over first. Everything is in the numerator. Well, for the most part, except for the negative one third, but it's okay. We'll treat the negative one third as a coefficient. The only thing that's out of place is this 10 minus y. I'm going to move that 10 minus y over. And now I should have a clean separation of variables here.
okay? So you only want on the left side what is absolutely necessary. So I need the dy, I need the y, but any coefficient, I'm just going to try my hardest to leave it on the right side. This negative one third doesn't have to be over here. So any leftover, I'm gonna to move to on the right side here. Okay, so this is looks like du over u, which is natural log, but this is not a clean just u value or a clean variable. So I gotta go through u substitution there. So the left side becomes negative one du over u. So this comes out cleanly to be just natural log or negative natural log. Replace the u back in terms of the original variable. And then the right side, there's just power rule, right? There's no variable, but it's just a one. If you don't see a variable, Right, if you don't see, uh, if you put the coefficient out, there's no variable, just put a one there, right? Integral of one is just x. Uh, the two negatives, I can divide the negatives on from both sides. And we never change the sign for the plus C, right? Plus C minus C, we're just gonna all just, um, just always generalize it as a plus C. Okay, so now I have the antiderivative. I'm taking care of the calculus. So now I just have to figure out how to solve for C. I have an initial condition, three, nine. I'm gonna take that, plug it in, find my C value. So I get C, natural log of one is zero, zero minus one is negative one, so C is negative one. Okay, I'll replace negative one in for the C value, right, right here. That's where I started my substitution, so that's where I need to go back to. Uh, now I'm going to solve for y. So I'm going to get this natural log to go away. So I'm going to raise both sides, exponentiate both sides with base e. This cleans up to be just absolute value of 10 minus y. So this side, natural log and e uh, cancels out, but here there's no natural log, so all this is going to stay. Uh, we'll drop the absolute value, have a plus or minus show up on the other side. And I want this to be a positive y, so I'll move the y to the uh, right and then move this e over to the left here. So I have 10 plus or minus e to the one third x minus one is equal to y. Okay, so the, we have one more decision that we can make. And that is, do we keep the positive or the negative version, right? Since these are really two separate answers. And the way that we tell is we look back to our initial condition and we look at the sign of the y value. Whatever the sign of the y value is, it's gonna be the sign that you wanna 
um, key. So if that's a negative nine, then we want that to be a, a minus e. If that's a positive nine, then we want it to be a positive e. So it's a positive e then. Okay, any questions here? Let me do one more because this is something is still under this differential equation uh, format. It says, given that the derivative is what was um, specified before, find the second derivative. So that means we're going to find the derivative on uh, below this, okay? So let's just see if we can go through that process. I'm gonna clean this up though. Distribute the negative through or negative one third through. Okay. Now I can just apply power rule to both of these terms, right? So here's my second derivative. Negative 10 thirds, we know we'll just go to zero. One third y, right? One third is the coefficient that stays. Now let's think about what happens to y. The derivative of y is one, but we're doing dy dx, right? We're finding the derivative of y with respect to x. So we need a dy dx here. So basically the second derivative is just one third dy dx. So now we know what dy dx is, right? dy dx is just this expression that was given to us at the beginning. So we keep the one third and then replace the dy dx with everything we see here. Now we wanna find uh, the second derivative at x equals one. So at x equals one, do we have an order pair that we can match this with? Order pair for f of x, at one, we have four. So that's the order pair we're gonna use, one, four. So this gives us negative six over nine, which is negative two thirds. Now, something related to this is, let's say the problem says, you know, find an equation of the tangent line at one four um, and approximate using linear approximation. Uh, can we, what can we say about that approximation? Is that approximation gonna be under approximation or over approximation? And I think a problem similar to that showed up on the AP exam. So I want you guys to be able to look at a second derivative value and to be able to make that decision, right? So we, if we want to determine whether it's under or over approximation, we want to think of this as con concavity, right? You see negative concavity, this is concave down. And a concave down graph looks like this, right? And if the con graph, concave down graph looks like this, any tangent to that concave down graph it's gonna sit nicely above the curve. So that tells us that any approximation using a linear method is going to end up giving us a value that is above the curve and therefore an over approximation. Okay, so if you took the first AP exam, you may have noticed a problem like this if it was in your version where is asking to uh, do linear approximation, but then using the second derivative value to help you confirm whether it's under or over. So if you can um, verbalize this as concave down or concave up, if it's positive, draw a graph that matches that uh, property, and then you can see whether the line is sitting above or below. Okay, so for instance, 
if the graph was concave up, right, you can convince yourself that any point on that curve and you make it a, a, a tangent line, you're going to be able to convince yourself visually that, okay, this is obviously under approximation, whereas this is obviously over approximation. Yeah, those are the big things that stand out to me. Um, do you guys have any questions for me? Okay, you guys all got, you all uh, received your tickets. Okay, uh, so tomorrow uh, you will log in at 3.30. And you're going to be um, starting your exam at four o'clock. Uh, but if you have trouble loading your answer, um, there's now going to be this backup email submission. So um, was there anyone who took other AP exams and they got stuck and they got a chance to use this email submission? I know they put this into practice that second week of AP exams, but it wasn't available that first week. So um, um, anybody have a um, firsthand account as to how this works or because I'm just, uh, you know, reading emails or uh, reading information, but I, I, I don't have a firsthand account. Um, okay, but hopefully, uh, if you're having trouble loading like you did the first time, um, I think right after ex the exam, they're going to give you, um, it, uh, they're going to let you know that they didn't receive it and they want you to email, um, uh, your work uh, to a specified email address. So I don't know how this is going to work, but I think there, you won't have any danger of taking this second exam and not being able to submit it like the first time. Okay. So you're guaranteed that if you did, you know, if you did see the exam, if you did do it, um, you will get a chance to get it graded and you won't run into a, a second issue. Okay. Assuming that your network con uh, connection is good and you're able to actually log in. All right, good luck. Uh, if you guys have any questions, um, you know, feel free to send me a text reminder or um, if you're stuck on any problems, you can always take a screenshot of it and then send it to me through Remind and I can answer your question individually. Um, but I have additional problems here, additional FRQs. If you wanna look through uh, worksheets four through seven, um, hopefully uh, that will kind of get you up to speed in terms of what maybe to expect tomorrow. We really don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. Maybe it's gonna be a completely different set of problems. Maybe it's gonna be similar to uh, the topics that we've covered um, from the first exam. So, um, but either way, I hope you guys um, do well and are prepared and, and, that, um, and that you won't run into any other hiccups um, that you did on the first time. Mr. Yang, I don't think I got my e-ticket. We, like when were we supposed to get that? Um, you should have received it uh, yesterday. Now, my question is, are you able to go into your College Board account? Uh, I haven't tried that. I, okay. I just got the email that says, like, you got approval for the testing, but I didn't get any after that saying. This got is it. Okay, do. so I can hang on while you uh, log in uh, to your College Board account, because if they sent you that, um, you should have received it already. Um, yeah, you too, PJ. Uh, if you should have received it already, and yeah, I'll, I'll hang on while you go and look in your college, uh, college board account. And for the rest of you, uh, hopefully, if you didn't receive an e-ticket, uh, uh, it should have been, you sh it, it should be there for you in your student account. Okay, I'm signing in right now. Okay, I'll, I'll hang on here. All right, Justin, good luck. Okay. 